Welcome back to the run home with Joel and Fletch. Final half hour of the program. Uh, keep the text coming through, 0457 736 736. Uh, we might sneak some calls in later in the hour as well. one three hundred oh one eleven seventy. 1170 Reviewed the summer of sport. Uh, we spoke about Fletch in Vegas. Uh, Ruben Cotter, who joined the program. And uh, much, much more. The podcast, of course, will be waiting for you. But it is a Tuesday. So it is True Crime Tuesday. Go for it, tourist. Psycho killer. Tuesdays on The Run Home with Joel and Fletch. We discuss, dissect and delve into crimes of the past. It's time for True Crime Tuesday. I reckon, Brian, uh, this next fellow has the board lit up as a keeper last time. Yes. And when it comes to True Crime Tuesday, they love him. His name's Mark Morrie, News Corp, uh, Crime Corp. Editor. <laughs> News... <laughs> News Crawler. <laughs> <laughs> News Corp Crime Editor, Mark Morrie. Welcome to The Run Home. Yeah, g'day, guys. Now, Moz, big couple of weeks. Big week. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the Dodger, Roger yes. Rogerson, today. Um, are you all right with those headphones? <laughs> yeah, no, they're... Uh, you don't have to keep it on. You obviously have guys with bigger heads than <laughs> me, which is bloody hard, you know, because I'm a journo. <laughs> um, okay, so the life and times of Roger, obviously it's been well documented through, you know, various TV shows. From your words, how was he as a bloke? It's, it's really good company. You know, like really charming. We used to, we got on the drink quite a bit towards, you know, over the last 10 years before he got locked up. Cause, uh, um, and he was, he's great entertainment and you'd go to the pub and honestly, the amount of people that want to come up, you know, go to the pub with you and they've got mm. people scurrying away from Fletch. That's right. and, uh, <laughs> with Roger, people idolized him. They thought he was dirty Harry and kept our streets safe. And mm. it, he was great at selling it. You know, and you conned me. I was totally conned. Right. You know, um, but he was. Well, obviously, when he passed away, there was people who came out and said, in his early career, he was actually a very, very good policeman. A lot of people say he's very, a very effective policeman, but <laughs> kind of helps when you're allowed to load them up, fit them up. Um, he was getting information from the other crooks to lock up the competition. Mm. Um, so, although he was a bit good investigator, and I remember when we we were talking and he was very, very proud. There was a horrible murder, 71 up at Barara, a young girl kidnapped and, and murdered. And I was actually in her brother's class and Roger was so, he was talking about, and it was great investigation work, how they, they nailed the guy. And he was very, very proud of that. So there were some, some lockups, you know, early in his career that he was proud of, but on the whole, he, he was, he was mixing with some of the dirtiest guys in the CO, CIB from the moment he joined the force. He was crooked, you know. So do you think he became crooked or do you think he, he it was always his intention? I'm going to get in the police force and I'm going to make money by doing the wrong thing. Or I, it just fell into it. I think he fell into it. But right. I think, you know, there, there was all this, the dark side. He was taken to the dark side by, you know, mm. Nettie and all. Mm. Mate, you put the two intellects up. Roger wasn't going to be taken anywhere by Nettie. He was leading. You know, Roger was Super leader. smart. Very, very smart. Had a high IQ. Um, although, as smart as everyone we make tried to make him out, he's got locked up twice before he got done for Jamie mm. Gow. He was done by video, in, in, like on CCTV in 1990. He didn't learn his lesson then. No. You know, he was caught at a bank trying to put in a, uh, all this cash, and that brought him undone back then. But yeah, he, he did come across as very smart, but I think he was bad from the start. Mm. You know, I don't. I think you don't do what he did over all those years. I don't think you grow into it unless you're born that yeah. way. You know so, what I mean? So on that, Moz, did they ever um, land at a personality type for him? Was he ever branded with that? As, as, as far as like a sociopath or a... Yeah. I mean, I think now we yeah. all know that. And back then I think it was it was considered, you know, there were people scared of him from mm. really early, back in the 80s. You know, they were scared of Roger Rogerson. Here was a guy that didn't, eat, like, he'd wander around with that. You know, you see that iconic shot, him with a shotgun coming mm. out of a scene. Mate, he, he instilled fear in people. So, And those eyes, if you ask the wrong question, you've got the look in that, that Roger look, you know, the, the blue eye, it just goes straight through you like a pair of 38 bullets themselves. Mm. Um so I always think that he was a, he was a sociopath. He would kill. He didn't kill for enjoyment. He would just kill because it, if it was going to get in his way or it was a threat, mm. you know, it wasn't, you know, he'd just do it. Or if it was business, I, I'd imagine he'd do it. You know, he, he, he'd kill without compunction. I, I learnt later 
not while I was with him. Mm. I, yeah. I really, as I said, I just thought he was dirty Harry. They were the times. They were, you know, even Warren Lanfranchi, you know, which is the beginning of the end of Roger, people say, he had me convinced. He said, mate, he was a drug dealing, um, armed hold up mm. merchant. He'd pointed a gun at a cop. So he kind of made, made you feel as if to go, you know what? We were just cleaning up the streets of people that shouldn't be there anyway, which was just a total fallacy. So, so, yeah. so, he's, yeah, so he's been linked to other killings. Is that correct? Oh, mm. yeah. Uh, was, uh, how, guilty of how many? Well, he's only been found guilty of one. Yes. Right. Um, and that was what, 10 years ago? No, Jamie Gow. Yeah, 10 so, years Jamie ago. Jamie Gow's the yeah. only one. He's the, right? only, the only one who's been convicted of yes. murder. Warren Land Franchi, they talked about potentially in the line of mm. duty. He was at two other fatal shootings of armed hold up blokes before that, also in the line of duty. So that's three mm. in the line of duty. Um, I know that he, I, well, I'm convinced that he is behind the disappearance of a woman called Lynn Woodward who in 1981 gave evidence at the inquest mm. and said, I'm going to expose all the corrupt cops, blah, blah, blah. Um, the coroner said, oh, okay, we'll come back and we'll get back into this. She walked out of the coroner's court, never to be seen again. Wow. And she, the story is uh, Roger and Nettie got her at the back of the coroner's court, took her away. You know, And that was before. Now, the ones that he was actually knew about or actually instigated, like, you know, um, Christopher Dale Flannery, rent a kill. Mm, yes. I'm Roger, you know, behind that without doubt, you know. Along. Had they been seen together? Like, oh, yeah. they. So Christopher Flannery, who, this is the, the Drury. The Drury shooting. Yeah. The Drury shooting. But they were knocking around. So I'm just trying to – so I know it's a different time, but he had no problems knocking around or being seen in public with Nettie Smith. Nettie Smith. With Flannery. Or Flannery. Flannery yeah. No one ever said anything. No. But other policemen, his superiors never said, stop well, knocking around you know, you're a, you've got to remember back then, the informants was a very a big part of how you, you got information on crooks. So you could sell it that way, couldn't well, you? Well, yeah, you mm. could sell it that way, going, well, mate, you know, and that probably worked. He Because Nettie would have been given up every other heroin dealer in town yes. so that you get rid of him, you know. Um, it was a different time, you know. The one thing I did hear about, because Flannery had to go, well, and I even asked Roger about, you know, Flannery. I said, what? And he said, mate, he was a pest. He was a menace. He mm. had to go. And I've since, like, you know, a couple of people warned Flannery after the, the Drury shooting, mate, you're off. You're going <laughs> to, it's not a good place to be. Get out of town. And um, then he'd be there with Roger and Roger go, hey, mate, how are you going? He said, give him a cuddle. And then, you know, the next month organised getting him whacked, you know. so. And, and what was Roger's motivation for all that sort, was he a punter? Like, did he? No, that's. So, what was the money? It was just more money driven. Well, no. Well, I think it. No, I think it was power. Right. Because to be honest, he, he only ever, you see him in um, secondhand Falcons. Mm. And the first one was one when he tried to run me over back in nineteen eighty six. So I got sent there as, as a junior reporter. I didn't mm. know him. He'd been kicked out of the force. Got involved in a punch up. So I, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So in eighty six. How long was he in the police force for? Ah, uh, well. A, about 20 odd years. Bef so, yeah, so he got kicked out in, in 86. Four. Uh, they've got him under technicality for giving up an informant, which you're not allowed to do. And he said live on TV that Lenny McPherson and Nettie Smith were informants. And that was against police. Roger rules. said that live on TV? Yeah. Wow. There's a bit of a falling out between. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah. So I got sent along and um, I'm out the front <laughs> waiting. There'd been a few other media, had been there, you know. I was obviously the last in stupidly. And then I'm in the driveway when all of a sudden out of the, out comes Roger barreling in his Falcon. And I jumped out of the way and years later I said, mate, first time we met, you tried to run me over. He said, if I'd tried, you wouldn't be here. Oh. You know, he had just that little rascal look in his eye. So when did you become, well, not, not mates, not mate, yeah. acquaintances. Well, that, was did. he using you, do you think? To write oh yeah, stories? he was. So totally, you know, the, it wasn't until about, 2005 that we really, and then we probably drank every two, three weeks for about 10 years. Um, it was after his, his second stint in jail and I, I met him at a, a function at Bankstown and I went out to, to try and meet him. I was told to go and meet him. Then after that, we met regularly. He came in and did a blog for us at, at the Daily. Oh, okay. Daily, right. Um, on Underbelly. Yeah. When the Underbelly, the Golden mm. Mile was on. So he'd come in and answer people's questions. And the payment was, we'd go over and I'd have to buy all these drinks. The thing with Roger is, 
he never put his hand in his pocket. And if mm. he did, you'd, you're a bit worried about what he was yeah, going to pull right. out. No, but you paid for everything. And that was his payment. It was literally as much as he could drink. And we'd go on these drinking things around Surrey Hills. And as I said, everywhere you went, yeah, you know, they wanted to talk to him. Did him. he have family? Kids? Yeah, he did. He's two, married to Joy years ago and two daughters, uh, which estranged relationship. And right. then he married Anne Malocco uh, a few years up afterwards, who also did a stint in jail because she refused to talk about, uh, she did weekend detention, you know, so um, not giving Roger up. Do, do you think there's any, because I, I thought when Nettie Smith passed away, there might be memoirs or, or things written down about what went on, or is that not the the code? Like in the, well, in the old days, you don't, would, is there anything like that, do you think, maybe I in a safety uh, deposit box? Th no, I don't think Roger would have, um, you know, anything incriminating. Although he, there's a, a, another reporter called Neil Mercer who just wrote recently, he said he's doing a book, very timely, on Roger and Nettie. He's very smart. He's waiting until they're both dead before it gets yeah. Yeah. That's not yeah. silly. But he wrote, he said that he was talking to Roger and Roger said, mate, there's a whole lot of stuff under my house as well. Roger's in jail. Go and have a look. So that'll be interesting to see. I, I don't... I don't ex expect Roger would have anything damning or, or revealing about any of what he really did, you know. I'd really like to know. Like, everyone wants to know where Christopher Dale Flannery is. That's yeah. that's the big one. Um, although, Lynn Woodward. No, Christopher Dale Flannery was a killer, you know. Yes. And that was how he used to justify things. And that was how yeah. I, you used to think, oh, well, mate, he was just getting rid of scum. Mm. And it wasn't until after he was charged with the murder of Jamie Gow that I dug deep. My boss said, go dig. And then that's when I found the true story about Lynn Woodward. Mm. And that's when I thought, Jesus Christ, you were just a cold blooded kid. Yes. You know, it didn't matter to you. That person was a threat to you. She was nothing but a decent human person. She was the Sally Ann Huckstep that yes. we, we don't know about. She was mm. just as brave as Sally Ann. And oh, look what happened. Sally Ann was found in the duck pond in Centennial Park because she repeatedly went on and talked about police corruption. But who was charged with that? No one was uh, Nettie was charged and I think he was acquitted. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So there's, you know, Nettie, everyone thinks he's strangled her, you know, but there are other, other suspects. But um, Do you think, Moz, the fact that, like, what about the police force of the time or the politicians of the time? Are they culpable in all this sort of stuff? Because oh. they would have known. I mean, he was protected politically. And you've got to remember... I mean, the coat of arms, I'd say, for New South Wales then should have been a brown paper bag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. You had Rex Jackson, Corrective Services Minister, that if you gave him enough money, um, you'd get a get-out-of-jail early card. And he did. That's what He went to jail for giving early release to crims who paid him money. Right? And that was our Corrective Services Minister. Yeah. Um, I know, guys, you know, the judiciary was, was a bit off. Cops were crook. Um so the politicians knew, you know, why were we the last city to get a, a, a casino, a legal casino in, in Australia? Mm, you would think the mm. first place would be Sydney, yep, wouldn't you? Yep. We're the last because there was so much money being made by the illegal gambling oh, yes. and all going all the way up, up the chain yeah. to all the politicians. No one wanted to legalise it because then the taxpayer might benefit rather than the politician and all the, all the crooks and cops. Yeah, we, there was a lot of – I remember as a kid going – I won't name which one, but it was in Chinatown and it was an illegal casino. Yeah. And I've never seen anything like it. Oh, wow. they're great. I went to the one, of, you know, the <laughs> knock, knock door slides yeah. across like in TV. And uh, it was in Dalian, I think it was the old Kellett Club or something. And, oh, it was amazing. There were people playing 2,000 a hand. You're talking wow. 1981, 82. How many were around? Like how uh, many illegal casinos were around? There were quite a few. I mean... I, I don't even, you know, back in the cross, there were two or three really big ones. You had the SP bookie at the pub. Mm. George Freeman was running all all of those. The two up. Oh. I mean, there are parts I miss of a little yeah. in Sydney. <laughs> don't you think? Was, I mean, was Roger taking a, a clip from all that? Or was that oh, mate, a bit would, below him? No. Is he higher than that? Oh, yeah, he would have been. He would have been getting the boys to go around. The money was coming to him. I, I remember talking to Louis Bayer, who came unstuck in the Royal Commission for drug, you know, working in the cross. He said he was paying King's Cross coppers 17 grand a week oh. in bribes. And how many coppers are we talking there? Well. Like, is it just that, is it just that police station? No, no, it was, it was endemic. 
you know, there would have been, there were brothels and other places operating in Western Sydney as well. I mean, there was nothing like the cross and the big, but there was, you know, SP bookmaking down in Wollongong, you know, there'd be, there'd be people operating there, paying people off. It was, it was the way they, they did, you know, they considered it controlled corruption, mm. you know? Um, so who's widely credited with cleaning it up? A and the second part of this is, do you feel as though we are a mile ahead of where we once were in that department? Yeah, we are. And it was the Wood Royal Commission mm. that really did it. And there was an MP who was back then called John Hatton who pushed and pushed and pushed. And eventually we had that Royal Commission. And that undid, that, that exposed all the corruption and all the dirty cops. And it started with, because of Rogerson. And they mm. might, and, um, you know, it took a decade. So why would it take a decade if we knew about corruption? Again, the politicians pushing back. But it was a South Coast member, Independent John Hatton, who pushed it. And, um, yeah, and that Royal Commission just exposed. And, uh, I mean, I that was an eye-opener for me because... I kind of, I lost all my best contacts because they're all found to be corrupt and <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. I, I drank with them all and I just yeah. thought, gee, we've, I was a young boy from Hornsby. I just thought you didn't pay for drinks when you were with, <laughs> with policemen. I thought it was really good fun. Yeah. You know? It was, but I had no idea how crooked they were. And Moz, the, the last, or well, the one he got charged with, Roger, the Jamie Gout oh. thing, if he had all this money coming through the 80s, he's obviously just done it for the, for the money then. Like yeah, he, he did. I mean, odd. his kids were going to private school. He had a holiday house up at Long Jetty. Um, you know, he, although he didn't pay for anything. Roger, yeah. as I so said, where did his money go? That's what I was thinking. A lot on legal fees by the 80s. Gotcha. You but know? he was, definitely wasn't a punter. No, no. Mm. He he wasn't, and he didn't smoke. And as I said, he didn't pay. You know, he, you know but he, he was charged with um, attempted murder of, conspiracy to murder Mick Drury, which he beat, right? So... He had other charges. There are a lot of charges. You know, he spent a bit of his money there. Uh, even the the Jamie Gow one, I, I think it was more about relevance. I can still be part yeah, of the big really? time. Yeah. So the other bloke, the other cop, McNamara. Yeah. Would have they ever? Were their paths ever crossed? Oh, yeah, working. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Back, you know, and like I tell you, nearly cops get moved around so much and they cross over. And back then they socialise. They all meet each other. Mm. You know, they all they all know each other some way. Or not, you know. Um, so, I mean, in fact, just before, about three weeks beforehand, I was drinking with Roger. He said, oh, you've got to come and meet this new this bloke I'm working with, Glenn McNamara. And I never did, you know, yeah. but because he said, oh, mate, we're doing a bit of work together here and there. I mean, I did get that close to Roger. The fact, after he got convicted, I, we did a 16-page wraparound saying, um, serial killer with a badge, mm. um, which wasn't my headline, but I do claim occasionally, depending on what company. Mm. Um and I, the day it was published, I felt really bad. I felt like I'd betrayed him. That's yeah. how well he'd conned me. Yeah. Here I am. I've dug around for a few months finding this guy was a, a killer, a cold-blooded killer, a heroin dealer himself. And there I'm thinking, gee, I've betrayed him by telling the truth about him. That's how good he was. That's how. Even though he's going to jail, so you, you're safe from him. When you're writing these stories, in the back of your mind, are you still picturing him reading the article? Oh, yeah. I know he was reading the articles yeah. and I know he, he went ballistic. Yeah, oh, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. And I, again, stupidly, like, I, I had run into... And, and what part of it does he go, like, what was... We never got to talk in depth. Yeah. <laughs> I ran into him once in jail. He just waved at me because I was going through the jail. And then I I was in a, an empty court when he'd been brought up from the cells for a, a legal matter. So there was no jury, no one. And we chatted, like, while he's waiting to... He's still waiting for trial and everything was fine. And of course, the 16 pages hadn't come out. And after he was convicted, I went along to the sentencing thinking, Roger will be pragmatic. He knows his stuff now. Yep. I never wrote anything bad about him while, until he was gone. He's convicted. Yep. Well, God, I was wrong. Because I, I, and I did, I went along to the court thinking, I'm going to face him. He will be pragmatic. I always thought pragmatic. And he's seen me. I'm because it was such a busy court, we were in the, almost the jury box for the sentencing. So it, I was straight in his line of sight when he comes up and he went red and he's kind of stood up and he's made a gun point. He's, you, oh. I can't say it well. even on any show. And his solicitor had to calm him down. And even though he's a 74 year old man, you know, who hobbles around and I know he's about to do life, it, it rattled me. And a few other people came up and said, how do you feel? I said, 
Not the best. But, but, but what, what do you think it was? Yeah, he felt it was a betrayal. And I know now that right. I wrote. In the manner in which you were writing about him. Afterwards. Yes. And he, yeah, he obviously, I've since learned that. Does that rattle you a little bit when you, even though you know he's gone behind bars, does it rattle you or is it not so much you've, you've not been around? Not so him? much, but I did worry that there might be that loose cannon that might go, I'll go and do this for a favour. That, for yeah, Roger. that's right. Yes. It does. It, yes. A little bit. It did. But, um. Yeah, and I was surprised. I really did think he'd be programmed. I'd, again, I couldn't read Roger very well, obviously. <laughs> How do you think he would go, you know, because I know you're reporting on on these drug wars going oh, on yeah. on the bikies. That's a different matter. How would he go these days if he was put into this sort of time? Oh, he'd have so much more money now. But would he? <laughs> but would <laughs> well, they, he'd be taking money off him. Yeah, but I'm just wondering... Oh, he might. He might. I, I just don't understand why the crooks didn't shoot him back then when if they were all petrified of him. Because there were a lot of other – because the cops had the power. Mm. And if someone had knocked Roger, there would have been a whole lot of others that would have got them. They had the power. They had the courts on their side. They had every police officer. So they would have smashed their operations. Do you think all the other coppers knew he was corrupt? I think there would have been quite a few yeah. who did. And, like, you talk to people back then who – were very, very honest, but they knew about the corruption and with, that was, they just had to turn a blind eye. And it sometimes wasn't good for your career, you know. Um, it was a different time. You mm -hmm. know, now we have, you know, our cops are very, you know, I'm not saying there's not some little pockets of corruption. They're not, it's not corruption. Mm. There is so much money being made out there by these guys. I, you can't, nowadays. Nowadays. Yeah. That's what I mean. I think Roger would be, he'd be, oh, yeah. how much money can I get from these guys now? Because they're making so much more. Drugs had just become in the 80s. Heroin was, was the big money spinner. Um, but I, these guys now, I don't know how we'd go trying to take it. But there are now, there would be cops, you know, there'd be massive amounts of money being offered to them just for addresses to kill people. Yeah. Um, Far out. But... Our guys, are, there's so many oversights. Their training is so much better. Mm. Um, they get paid better now, do you think? Oh, yeah, they do. They really, yeah. I mean, right. they still need, they still should get a lot more. Yeah, but, yeah, but I'm thinking that they mustn't have been paid no, a that, whole lot back then. Rogers that was day. one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest things that came out of the Royal Commission. Besides busting up all the crooked cops, they started getting paid a lot better yeah. because it makes corruption a lot harder to, to try and carry out, you know. Mark Mori, we're done. The show's just <laughs> yeah. about done. Uh, that was good, mate. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Every time we have you on, we get the text board just frothing. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what do you got and coming up, mate? Now it won't be coming from Roger. Um, we've <laughs> yeah. got another series of The War coming out in about three, four weeks. Yep. It's gone quiet. Oh, I tell you what, though. So something's going to happen. Yeah. Mate, there's a, a major gang war out there that, that the cops have been brilliant in putting a lid on. But you'll forget there's also, we cover all a lot of kidnappings, and we had a period there where people were losing their fingers and toes. Like it was a la, la Mexico. We we reveal a lot a, a lot more. And again, Josh, mm. he's done a lot of the hard work, and I'm just a pretty face there, mm. so that we can get the female view. Can I say this? <laughs> can I say this? Though? You know all the cocaine washing up here. Oh, I was wondering. Well, you, yeah. how long no, did you no, spend no. down at yeah. Bondi Beach? I've, no. <laughs> so I've got spies in my camp who have spoken to other spies. Apparently, they know where it's come from, which cartel it is, and it's two ton. Yeah. Well, I. Have you heard that? I'd heard a ton yeah. and that a plane went over that scared the hell out of them and ka -chung. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, quite a, and no one's kind of blinked, mm. you know, no. and it still hasn't made a dent in the mark. Like there's still a lot out there. So it's just, it's waves of it coming in, so, so to speak. That was mm. an accidental mm. joke. I mean, coming in on waves. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mark, that was good. <laughs> we're actually done with the show now. We've got to go. Um, right. Mark, um, we appreciate your time, Moz. We'd love to have you back any time. We thanks to News Corp for letting you come on board as well. But that music means we're done. We're done. If you want to catch up with uh, the show and particularly Mark's chat there for True Crime Tuesday, the podcast will be waiting for you.